Welcome to the Joe Watt Podcast. I am Joe Vendramini from the Range Cattle Research and Education Center from the University of Florida. And today, our guest is Dr. Mario Binelli. Mario, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, John, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And Mario, can you please give us some background information about you? Yes. So uh, I have a, a bachelor's degree on uh, uh, agriculture from the University of Sao Paulo. And I followed that up with a master's degree in the physiology of lactation that I obtained here from Michigan State University. And then I have a PhD from the University of Florida uh, in uh, reproductive physiology. Then I went back to Brazil and I work as a faculty at the University of Sao Paulo working with the physiology of reproduction for 18 years. And then at the end of 2017, I was hired by the University of Florida and I've been working here since. It's been a pleasure to work here in the great state of Florida uh, for three years now. And, and Mario, and you, you have been focusing your program on reproduction primarily of beef animals. And there is one um, characteristics, I think, of, of the Southeast in general, but mainly on the Florida cattle, because of our influence of a Bozindicus animal or Brahman, like we, we always say. So because of that influence, we have seen that we also have some issues on puberty because related to those animals that, that has a little late maturity. Can you please comment about that and how do you see if that is really a problem or, or your thoughts on the issue? Yeah, so uh, Joel, from my, from my previous uh, research experience uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in South America, in which the majority of the cattle were Bos Indicus, uh, pure uh, Bos Indicus, uh, uh, over there, puberty uh, attainment is at two years, two years, 24 months. So anything that's less than that is already considered very good. So then I come here in Florida and what I see is a boss indicus influence cattle, but that means usually, uh, at least here, here in South Florida, uh, mostly Brangus. So it's a uh, 27% uh, uh, Brahma and the rest is Angus. So they are actually heavy Angus. And uh, these animals, they are being bred in most of the operations, not all, as yearlings. So uh, they do have, yes, a little bit of the influence uh, of, the, of, the, of the Brahma breed, but also they are still young, they're still growing. They are 12, 13, 14, 15 months of age. Uh, and that on itself uh, uh, is a limitation, uh, just age limitation for puberty attainment. Uh, so yes, we have focus on that category. Uh, there are strategies nutritional strategies, uh, some pharmacological strategies that we can use with these animals to try to increase the proportion of them that will be able to get pregnant as yearlings. So yes, that is a challenge. We have observed that in uh, the many herds that we have worked uh, throughout Florida. Uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, actually studying, uh, obtaining data, summarizing data, and trying to understand what is the extent of the problem. And, and Mario, you, you gave us a little information there about the, the potential solutions that you are probably pursuing regarding the nutrition or pharmacological or any other approach. So on the, on the physiological standpoint, uh, other than breed, uh, do, you, do you have some pretty clear ideas how we can make improvement in that area? Um, using those those tools, yes. So uh, uh, we have we have uh, uh, indeed just launched a a program which is a statewide program, and uh, it is called Know Your Heifer program. And the idea is to get the most basic information on the reproductive status of heifers prior to the beginning of the breeding season, so we'll know. Uh, and that's, that will vary according to, to the ranch that we, that we evaluate, but we will know what is the status in terms of uh, how close or how far are heifers, individual heifers from attaining puberty. So what's usually happening here, Joao, is that as the breeding season approaches, we have heifers that are in different stages of maturity. 
and that and they may be of the same breed they may be all brangas for example and they may be interestingly they may be weighing about the same you know 750 800 850 pounds you look at them they all look the same but they will vary widely in terms of puberty attainment we do evaluate puberty attainment using a tool which is called a reproductive tract score in which we can evaluate the development of the reproductive tract of the heifer and we can we can rate them between uh, between one and five so one is a infantile heifer and five is a heifer that's already cycling she's pubertal so she's ready to go and two three four they are in immediate scores so uh so if we are if we uh, if we're getting close uh, to the beginning of the breeding season and the heifer uh, is, a, is a score of one, is, she has a reproductive tract score of one, uh, she's, she, she might not even be able to get pregnant by the end of the season or she will get pregnant at the very end of the season and she will be a problem uh, to breed back and then subsequently at some point she's gonna fail. So uh, now she, if she's a four or a five, for sure she's gonna be able to breed very early in the season. And that's critical for heifers, for them to, as they enter their first breeding season, they sh we, uh, we should maximize the opportunities for these heifers to get pregnant early on, because that, that will give the, the, that will subsidize a whole lifetime of productivity for these heifers. So on this program, we go to the ranch, prior to the beginning of the season and we evaluate the heifers one by one. And right at that time, we'll give the result to the producer and on real time, and they will, re, uh, will, will, will usually make a decision right at that moment. So if there are just a few reproductive track score ones, some people will discard them or some people will, will send them to a different group. Uh, discard them, I mean, call them. Uh, if there's a large proportion of heifers, there are reproductive track score one, they might even delay their breeding season for two weeks, three or, or, or even a month to try to get most of them bred uh, within the scope of, that, of the, that breeding season. So it's a very powerful uh, management tool. Uh, what we see here, John, uh, 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 for this current breeding season, we have evaluated uh, about 1,500 heifers. Uh, our rangers, you know, north and south, they're doing very well. We have seen the majority of heifers uh, within the reproductive tract scores four and five, which means that they are actually ready to get bred and they will have a high probability uh, of being pregnant early in the breeding season. The second part of the program is to go back uh, and to do a pregnancy test. And then the heifers that we evaluated according to the reproductive tract score, now we'll see actually their performance. Did they really get pregnant or not? They get, did they get pregnant at the beginning of the season or only at the end of the season? And that will also be an important information uh, for the ranger. And, and Mario, when you, you say that you expose those heifers and then come back, so I think there is some diversity there because you're going to have some producers that probably try to do an AI and some protocols and some producers that will use just a bull, correct? That's exactly right, John. Uh, and the, and the, um, uh, one thing that will really benefit heifers, uh, independent of their reproductive tract score, uh, is to expose them to some kind of a synchronization protocol. And let me be very clear here. They do not need to be disseminated. Just exposure to, for example, MGA or to a cedar, and there's a, div uh, there's a diversity of protocols available. Uh, they have been approved. Uh, people use them all over the country and there's basically personal preference, but just for them, for animals to be exposed to, a, to progesterone, again, MGA or cedar, that will really uh, jumpstart their uh, reproductive, the, 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 the physiology reproduction system of these animals. And some of them, they will be getting very close to cycle, they will start cycling right away. And some that would be even a little farther from cycling, they will also be induced to cycle earlier. So uh, it, it, really, it really depends uh, on the producer and, and will depend on the, uh, uh, how um, willing the producer is to adopt technology, but there's technology out there and we are using that every day in the different ranches uh, to try to boost 
that uh, moment of a tenure of puberty. And, and it has been working very well. And, and Mario, this second step on, on the synchronization protocol, do you think that should come after the track score? Or do you think that should be applied to the whole herd regardless of the track score? So um, it's always, it, uh, it will be always beneficial to use a, some kind of a synchronization uh, a strategy. Again, regardless of using AI or, or not using mm -hmm. AI. And that also applies for cows. I know that, that, that that's not the topic for our discussion now and that there are challenges associated with synchronizing cows. But uh, uh, when you prime animals or when you expose animals, again, to some kind of progesterone, uh, that has only beneficial effects. And these beneficial effects are not only uh, regarding to synchronizing their estrogen cycle, but also again, to inducing jump-starting cyclicity, both in the prepubertal uh, uh, animal, the heifer, or the cow that had just had a calf, and now she has a limited amount of time to, to be ready uh, to breed back, uh, they will also benefit from, from, from exposing uh, to, from exposure to, uh, to progesterone. So specifically to your question, John, uh, uh, no, we are not selecting animals and applying protocols according to our evaluation. Everybody mm -hmm. should get a protocol. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes no one gets a protocol. It really depends on the, on the operation. But we're not saying, okay, apply a protocol to this one, but not to that one. We are doing in, uh, 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 as, a, as a whole group of animals. And, and Marius, since you got here and started your position at the University of Florida, I know you have done a lot of work on farm with producers. Like now you have your program that you just described, but you have few properties that you really went there and work with the producer on, on, on their heifers primarily. I'm not aware of the mature cows, but we are talking about the heifers. So can you please tell us uh, some of your experience on those uh, on farm um, trials that you have done? Yeah, João, uh, it's a pleasure, to, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to, to talk about that because uh, we know uh, AI, artificial insemination has been stigmatized as something that's very, very difficult, very hard to do, uh, very costly uh, in, the, in many other uh, objectives. And it is indeed a, a technology that, that has many details. So when we started here in Florida three years ago, and uh, we talked to ranchers, and uh, and uh, some of them are our are our friends, like uh, like like the ranch of, of Ralph Palais over there in Okeechobee. You have been working with him for three years now, um, uh, and then uh, what we see is uh, uh, we don't know what we're doing wrong. This is the question that people that really want to do AI they are not understanding some of their uh, results that are lower than they expected. So we said, we need to understand the problem. To understand the problem, our approach was actually to go to the range and do, together with the producer, every step of the process, from evaluating heifers, inserting cedar, removing the cedar, giving the injections, recommending uh, 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 an inseminator, uh, giving tips for how to check for heat if, if heat detection was, uh, uh, was used. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then evaluating the results of that artificial insemination uh, with, a, with, a, with a pregnancy test later on, or sometimes multiple prep tests. And, um, and I think that, you know, uh, specific, specifically for, for uh, Mr. Palais, but for uh, other people that, that we also have been working with, they're all very pleased because we are able to achieve a realistic number, which is, you know, some, uh, in, in, with heifers, somewhere between 40 and 50% pregnancy to that AI. But most importantly, again, because of all the beneficial effects of using a protocol, by the end of the season, usually they, they'll have uh, more than 90% uh, pregnant. So uh, that's usually uh, numbers that they uh, uh, recognize as, as, as good and they've been calling us back. So that's, that's, that's the biggest, I think, uh, uh, happiness for us, an accomplishment that we're that that that, that uh, they have faith in our work, and uh, next year we're there again and try to get it even a little better. Mm -hmm. And and Mario, with your um, 
all, all the time that you work in Brazil, that as you mentioned, was with purebred bozincos, right? You have there, and then you came here, you have these crossbred animals that in theory, it, it should be even, even a little more advanced on their puberty because they have some Angus or Hereford or, or Shorehorn or something English there that will make them a little probably better on the puberty standpoint. Um, so what are the main differences or similarities that you, you saw on the reproduction standpoint between, between Brazil and, and the purebreds and, and here on these crossbred animals? Yeah, that's a that's a, that's an excellent question because I've been uh, uh, I've been reflecting about that since I since I started even before when I was applying for the job and thinking about my interview, and then now I have some uh, on the ground boots on the ground experience here. But uh, here here uh, in Florida uh, where I have more experience, people are usually very good with nutrition and very good with forage management. Uh, they take care uh, uh, of the condition of their animals. They're really aware of, of, of how important it is to have animals in good body condition uh, when they're approaching uh, breeding. So you, so you don't see skinny cows around. You see cows and, and heifers that usually are, are, are well-fed and ready to breed. This is a complete different reality when you go to South America. So it's not uncommon to see cows uh, with a body condition score of three and five, and, and as they are getting ready to be bred, <clears throat> so uh, so and, that, and, and we know that that uh, uh, nutrition and reproduction they are very closely tied together. Uh, so here that's an advantage. However, you go to South America, uh, some of the uh, synchronization protocols that are available and the drugs that are available there that are not available here. Uh, they, they work miracles, I mean, scientifically proven miracles, and they will take cows that are not in good body condition, uh, in body condition scores, but they will induce them to cycle. They will bring them from anestrus, or they will induce prepubertal heifers to puberty, and through those pharmacological strategies, they will get bred in very high numbers. So that's, uh, so it, it, it's interesting. So I'll say that, that in Brazil, the, in South America, the uh, input, the um, benefit of the, of the reproductive technologies uh, is very clear and it is needed for cows to get pregnant uh, by, uh, during the breeding season. While here, while use of the protocols is, is less, it's used in a, uh, the, the number of drugs that are available is also less. Uh, but the cows are so well fed and they're in, in, in such a good uh, uh, body condition that they will end up getting pregnant. They might not get pregnant at the very beginning of the season, but they, they are very good. Uh, on average here in the U.S., the, in the cow herd, the average uh, uh, calving rate is, is, is between 93 and 95 percent. So that's, uh, that's an amazing number. It's a great, that's average, national average. So that means that people are doing good job. And if it is not for uh, reproductive uh, uh, technologies, uh, it is because of nutrition. Uh, and uh, I take my hats off to that. People that are working in that area, they're doing a great job. So, so these are the, the main difference. So the, uh, the boss syndicates predominance in South America uh, and all the challenges with reproduction, uh, they are being overcome with a very excellent very excellent reproductive technologies developed on, uh, uh, in that region and they use very effectively there. And, and Mario, uh, we, we had many, many more tops to talk about it, but we are going towards the end of our conversation here today. So I, I would like to thank you very much for participating in the podcast today. And I am Joe Vendramini. Joe what? <laughs> 